This simply raising our voice mentorship course is inspired by the HBO original documentary Simple Luis, a portrait of the pioneering activist Luis A. Miranda Jr. Hello, my name is Kristen CC Battle, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm wearing a fierce fuchsia blazer with gold earrings and a pink lip. I am a brown skinned black woman with curly natural hair that has been pulled and slicked down into a low bun. I'm the daughter of a sign language interpreter and a pastor, and I'm from the Miccosukee land, also known as Miami, Florida. I am an organizer, a social impact strategist, whose North Star is simple, to make as many things as equitable and accessible as possible. And in my career, that quest has taken me into civic engagement, politics, youth organizing, women leadership, et cetera. So my story, <laughs> I came into organizing, as I imagine, as most of you have or will, I was pissed as hell. You know, I was pissed about a lot of things. When I was in college, I had a lot of frustration about the way Black students were being treated on campus. And that frustration came to a boiling point when I saw that same mistreatment of Black students was mirrored on the national level, watching the narrative of the DREAM Act leave out the experiences of Black immigrants. Though I'm not an immigrant, my ancestors were forcibly brought here to the Americas. I recognize that whether the migration was forced or not, Black immigrants are important and are valid, but add it to the richness of our Miami culture and community. So I started organizing with my peers and I quickly realized the gap of knowledge of the political process that my peers and I had that left us without the ability to understand all of the ways that the opposition would leverage the political process to ensure the DREAM Act wasn't passed. And there I was, pissed as hell again, feeling defeated again, silenced and frustrated. And though my frustration was valid, it was made clear to me that it it was a strategic move that my peers and I didn't have access to the knowledge to really understand how to influence the political process. We were just told to vote. And after talking to my peers, I realized we weren't apathetic. We, we were pissed. We weren't unmotivated. We just didn't have access to the information. So we created workshops. And the workshops brought together elected officials to campus to talk about what they did. And those workshops turned into a civic engagement framework I created called Passion Framing, which connects the micro issues that we care about to the political seat that has the power to change it. And it was then that we were able to make real connections for a community of people who were not only strategically silenced, but who were preoccupied with the burden of surviving, which I imagine a lot of you all can resonate with. And a lot of that magic happened with the connections because what we realized quickly is that the candidate will change, but the power of the seat will not. And giving my peers access to this information allowed us to build a base and fundamentally change the outcomes of elections in our community. And the passion framing framework has been used now throughout my career, training young people and communities in all 50 states and territories. So I know you're wondering like, why does this little victory matter? And if you're frustrated like me, you know, if you're frustrated and have ever felt silence and maybe feel like or have felt like the participation doesn't 
align with the progress that we deserve. I just want to name that that's valid. And there's a solution, y'all. If we can change the way that we think about elections and the way that we then talk about elections, we can change the way that we participate in elections and fundamentally change the outcomes and hold these folks accountable. Because it's intentional that we've been socialized to believe that the issues that we care about are separate from the political process and our vote. It's intentional that we've been taught that voting, even if done every four years, will yield the progress we deserve in our communities. And that's fundamentally not true because it, is, it isn't just about voting. Voting is a crucial step and it is definitely an act of harm reduction, but it is not the only one. We need the protests and mutual aid and the organizing coupled with leveraging the power of the seats elected officials occupy because elected officials are our tools not our saviors we have to disrupt the norm that our participation is dependent on our inspiration in a candidate and instead we need to fundamentally educate and understand the power of the seat and elect accordingly one of my favorite authors of all time, Adrienne Marie Brown said something that fundamentally changed the way that I look at this work. She said, we are living in someone else's imagination. So understanding that we're living in someone else's imagination, we must remember that as we navigate through the different processes that give that imagination, that vision power like voting, we have to fundamentally shift the way that we think about it to be able to leverage it for ourselves and our communities. So I have a question for you. What is your dream? What is the world that you want to live in in 10 years? And are your votes and actions getting you closer to that? because it's important for us in community to get clear of our dreams so that everything that we do, every election, everything we participate in is an organizing opportunity. Because when we're clear about the dream that we want, it becomes much more difficult for others to pull us away from it. And it becomes a lot easier to identify the things that aren't in alignment with that dream. It's easier to see the policies that are in alignment with that dream, easier to see the practices that are in alignment with that dream and the candidates who are in alignment with that dream. So my invitation to you is clear and simple. Change the way that you talk about elections and think about the power of the seat, right? Think about what does this seat have the power to control and use that as an educating opportunity to move you closer to your dream. Then bring your cousins, <laughs> bring your cousins along on that journey so that you can figure out how every action and vote will move you closer to that dream. Because when we piecemeal our participation in elections, we will have piecemeal progress. So again, state your dream, change the way that we're talking about elections, think about the power of the seat, and then vote early, bring your people, and don't forget to fill out your census. Thank you, bye. Hello, my name is Jean-Pierre Williams Comrie. I'm a black woman. I have light red glasses and long locks. I'm from Panama. My people are black people, black women and girls, children, immigrant people, and anybody committed to liberation. I am a daughter, a mother, an organizer. I'm a human rights strategist and the current executive director of Afro Resistance, 
and a member of Radio Caña Negra. Today, I'll be discussing Black women from Latin America, organizing and politics. Aquí estamos, here we are. The journey that has led to the work that I do today has to do with my beginning of organizing, was seeing my grandmother and my parents organize in Panama. One of my earliest and clearest memory was being with my mother during an election day in Panama. I was probably around six or seven. Neither of my parents ran for office, but they were active in a political party. I remember that my mother one year was in charge of making sure that everybody that was volunteering in a small assigned radius at the polls were fed breakfast, lunch, and dinners. I remember that my mother and I were back and forth to the restaurants and the polls all day long, picking up and then delivering food. We did this all day from before the sun was up until later in the evening. Now, this is only one of the roles that when you think about processes and elections, women are behind the scenes, making sure things are happening. Yet, we don't always get recognized or acknowledged as being politically active. My journey has also been accompanied by being surrounded by amazing Black women whom I have learned and whom I have grown from. And this includes my grandmothers, my mother, and many aunts who would not consider themselves organizers, but taught me the instinct of organizing because they made things happen, not only for their families, but also for their communities, be it through their church, through their women's groups, bingos, etc. I myself have mobilized and activated my community to engage in social change and justice simply by being an authentic and active part of the communities that I organize in and about. Meaning that I have always been an actual member of every single community that I represent or that I work in. For example, as a human rights strategist, I organize around immigration. Sadly, I have now been a migrant for most of my life and in several countries. Migration happens for many reasons, but sometimes the focus on the individual and not on the causes of why mass numbers of people migrate. And this is where the need to look at how when people vote in the United States, it impacts US foreign policy abroad is, or should be. Now, this could mean many things of why people migrate. It could mean loss of jobs. It could mean loss of land for agricultural exploitation, like in countries like Honduras, Nicaragua, and Panama. It could mean that people lose their ancestral lands where they have lived, or lived on for generations. It could mean actual US-led military interventions. And it could mean natural environmental reasons such as earthquakes, hurricanes, etc. At the end of the day, the vast majority of immigrants are here due to economic need for our families and loved ones, both here in the United States and abroad. Migration is not an easy road. And for Black people, for Black women, for Black trans women, for Black girls, for Black boys, for Black children, migration is more precarious. It's more violent. And because we're Black, it is more invisible. And you will rarely hear about it. Now, Black women, we have always migrated. We have always moved. Why? Because the dominant view of Black women has mostly been that we should be workers. And to work, we have had to be in constant movement, no matter where we are. And that movement, along with other things, brings racism, 
and sexism. That combination has led to many issues that we still have today, including domestic violence, unemployment, poverty, high maternal mortality, sexual abuse, child sexual abuse, and many others. These are all issues that we have had historically. But let's fast forward to 2020 and the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic has surfaced these issues to a point where individuals and society in general can no longer ignore them easily. Where just four years ago, they could sweep them under a rug and call it the day. Which takes me back to the topic of this masterclass. Aquí estamos, here we are. Part of the conversation, in my opinion, needs to include that social justice and civic engagement takes place every single day, not every four years. And it takes place at every level. We need to move away from thinking that it begins and it ends with voting only for the president. It also means that even if we cannot vote here, like myself, we have an important role to play. Local elected officials, make day-to-day -day changes and impacts to our day-to-day -day life. Even if we cannot vote, we still have access to those locally elected officials. We need to know who they are and knock on their doors because they play a vital role in our communities. And we have to hold them accountable since they're part of the community. One of the greatest triumphs today is that the same women that have been doing the behind the work are now running for offices, not only in the United States, but also in the region. What is one of those examples, for example, one of those examples in Colombia, we have Francia Marquez Mina, a black woman, a dear friend as well, once a domestic worker, a teen mother, an actual minor, she is now campaigning to be president of that nation with the large support of her community, a large support of her country, and a very large international support. We are seeing more and more Black women from all countries in Latin America, from many walks of life, running for offices at different levels of society. But what is important here is to know that their campaigns are not based on their family wealth or private companies that place them there. They are based on people power. They're based on collective decision making. These women are courageous. These women are audacious. And they know that they're entitled to run. They have the power and they have the fundamental right to elect and to be elected. The models that are being developed as we speak just a few years ago did not exist. This is what being part of a movement does. So for people within organizations, movements, one of the to-dos is to recognize Black women for our full humanity and all our contributions to different movements in general. If you're not part of an organization, this is your opportunity. Get engaged in your community. This could be locally or could also be by issue. If you are Latine, Latinex, Latina, Latino, or an immigrant and already part of an organization at any level, and do not see women that look like me, meaning black, ask where we are, because we obviously exist. And us not being at the table means that we are not part of a community. And maybe we're not wanted in your community. So you need to know what's up with that. Get to know what candidates and elected officials' positions are on US foreign policy and interventions. How do they benefit or not benefit your people? And how do they impact Black and Indigenous communities and their lands abroad? 
Also, support black woman candidates and do not run against us because you believe you can do a better job. Even if you can't vote, make sure to support the campaigns. If you do not know about shared decision-making and power, or if you do, deepen your understanding, which means, and this means that organizations and community groups should be the ones selecting who is running for office. And you can impact that if you're active in communities and organizations that are actively politically and in their communities. And there are many, there are many examples of that both here in the United States and also throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. Shared decision-making and power means that those elected officials are accountable to larger communities and take your demands and needs into consideration because they are part of the communities and this is relevant to us and irrelevant to migratory status. What gives me hope today is that my seven-year-old daughter and my nine-year-old son and their peers are growing up seeing black women, including black Latina, immigrants, trans women, being elected into office spaces, leading organizations, centering their issues. What gives me hope is that we are defining spaces, spaces and that the days of white folks showing up and that being enough are coming to a close. The bar is being raised collectively. My love for Black people deepens each and every day. Porque aquí estamos. We are here. Saludos. My name is Luz Marquez Bimbo. I'm a Black Boricua and an adult survivor of child sexual abuse, incest, and rape. I'm here with Ms. Gertha Paz, a face, who's of Haitian descent, and the mother of Essence Evanen, who was a father, brother, husband, and son as well as he was murdered by a Troy police officer in Troy, New York. We are both crime survivors. Our people represent the Black diaspora, namely the Caribbean, and we are speaking to you from Troy, New York, which is just outside of the capital region of New York State. Our, both, both our pronouns are she and her, and I'm wearing a dashiki shirt with black hair, and Miss um, Gertha is wearing a gold shirt with salt and pepper hair. I am a national survivor leader, deeply committed to survivor leadership, and a local community organizer with Troy for Black Lives. Gertha is a staunch advocate fighting for the accountability for her son, Edson Thevenin. And we're speaking to you today as Black women, because we know that when we fight together and build in solidarity, we win. And as Asada Shakur reminds us, we must love and support each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. My son Edson Thevenin was murdered by a Troy police on April 17, 2016, in Troy, New York. All the police saw was a big black male, but little did they know that he was a teddy bear, a person of integrity, valor, and a mentor. To make matters worse, after the killing of Edson in 2016, the former district attorney deprived me of getting accountability for Edson's life by the time I was seven, I was sexually abused. By the time I'm 12, I'm molested by my mom's boyfriend at the time. And by the time I'm either 14 or 15, I can never quite remember how old I was raped by a family friend. But like many other survivors, it didn't stop the abuse of other people around me. I know what it means to have my, com my own community harm me as well as my own community protect me. And so it is with that knowledge that we as a community surrounded and were intentional about our support for Gertha and other families. The Black feminist lesbian and survivor, Aisha Shahida Simmons, reminds us with her critical work of love and accountability that in, other, in order to unearth such pain and such trauma, we need to approach our communities with lots of love and accountability. And I would add that we need to do that same work around police violence with our communities. Because I believe that when we speak our truth, we begin to unpack such pain and we begin to heal from the trauma, the trauma that helps us to move through a healing journey and reminds us of our own humanity and that of our communities, especially those of us who are Black diaspora communities. 
looking back now, we failed our Gertha, we failed Edson, and we continue to fail our youth. Because, and in some ways, we continue to fail our children, both to the impact of child sexual abuse and police violence. As a society, we've stopped being accountable to each other. And then given this pandemic that we're in, we're struggling to figure out how to live in our cultural, collective community ways that we've longed have, have come from. The amazing poet June Jordan reminds us that we have all that is needed within us. And so given that, that is how we continue to do this work. And that is how we committed to building a relationship with Gertha and she with her. We use Black feminist processes, and we deepened our relationship with Gertha because we believe that as Black women, especially those that are, follow the Black women's narrative of kitchen tables, that we know that we can take over the world once we're in solidarity. Building our political power as community leaders led us to a few learnings that I want to leave you with. One of them is that we made no assumptions and neither did we make a decision for Gertha. In other words, no matter how difficult of a conversation or a question, we asked Gertha. We did it with a lot of love and compassion, but we didn't hold back and make decisions for her. Oftentimes, we want to protect people from feeling pain, but it's not our job to protect people. What it is our job is to witness and to stand with them so that they are not left alone in their pain and neither in silence. We acknowledged her anger, her hurt. We never told her to silence her feelings. And we used our transferable anti-rape crisis services skills in order to support her and her family. When no Goodnizer got together and called me and didn't, they went beyond Edson or me. They saw a mother who was in pain and they saw a wife in pain and children that's in pain. Mm -hmm. And then that's where they came from. They didn't know who I was. They didn't know why I came from. They didn't they disregard anything that the norm, the society put together to see. They, they put a, the human aspect behind what they do, a comfort, a, a strength behind the sadness that I could, okay, I could continue to move on no matter what it looks like. Doesn't matter what your religion is. It doesn't matter who's your preference. We all are different, but at the same time, we struggle for the same thing. To love, to comfort, and to see each other the way we want to be seen. To love each other. Not as the, um, the community of Troy Police, Troy Department sees us as like an object but we see each other right now as a whole, as a person thriving to move on, to support each other. And then we're gonna move it on to help other people in the same concept because we're looking beyond the norm of what mm -hmm. society want us to see. We love, with love for each other. And so that is our message to you all. Many of you are rising across the country to stand for Black lives. Many of you are rising across the globe because the killing of Black bodies is not just a United States uh, a pandemic, it is a global pandemic. And so when we come together as sisters and cousins of, and sibs of the diaspora, we can win. And I know that we can win. And I hope that our message empowers you and inspires you all to organize and to work together in that old Black narrative way that women did, that Harriet Tubman did, that Fannie Lou Hamer did, that Julia de Burgos did, that Mama Dingo did, right? Um, that, 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 that we know that we come from and that we know we will win. We wanna say thank you to Sample Luis and their vision of to, to, to engage in civic action and to look beyond voting into actual community organizing. And so thank you, Anashe.